Hey everyone, I like how in the beginning of the chapter, Kid is like, well, if Straw Hat is going to go ahead and mess around, we can use that to our advantage because he can be a distraction for us and we can just make our way to Kaido. But then Kid sees a poo and he's like... Catchmen. We start off with Lola asking Gotti to marry her, which is essentially what she asks every guy she meets. And I think that because she's been turned down enough, I feel like maybe Gotti would be the one to break the chain. And so maybe this cover story is an opportunity for Lola to finally gain a spouse. I'm not really sure when or when the wedding would take place. I'm assuming you could have it in Dress Rosa if you wanted to have like a Vegas style wedding. But regardless, this is something that I think is going to make Pound very happy because one of the things that he was talking about the last time we saw him is that he regretted not being there enough for his daughters. And he actually says, you know, congratulations. He yells out, congratulations on your marriage, Chiffon. So if he actually gets to witness Lola's marriage or Lola's wedding, I think that would make him very happy and that would kind of like kind of work to conclude an aspect of the family arc of some of these characters. The chapter begins with Luffy using Elephantogan on the fodder that was wasting the Oshiruko. And I gotta say that using an elephant gun <laughs> seems like too much. It seems like overkill for a fodder like that. Now I know at first glance it may seem baffling and strange that Zoro was able to find his way towards Luffy, but I think it's important to remember that it was previously, recently established that Zoro could have some sense or find some sense of direction via him smelling the scent of alcohol. And so it's not so much that Zoro was able to find Luffy as much as it is that he's just a raging alcoholic. And if you notice, there's a giant margarita glass in some of those panels. You see a, a giant wine glass or margarita glass in the middle of the party. So that explains why Zoro was able to guide himself. Now I know it says in the chapter that Zoro was technically able to follow the noise of Luffy's commotion and he followed that and that's how he was able to find him. But we all know the truth. It was the alcohol. Zoro tells Luffy, why can't you just infiltrate the place like a normal person? says the guy who just sliced up a tower. And I love Kid's reaction to, to him saying that because it reminds me of, remember Law, when Law was uh, barely getting acquainted with the antics of the Straw Hat crew? And at one point they were debating about like what Sanji was gonna cook for them. And Law is like, I don't like bread. But then he catches himself and he's like, oh no, what am I turning into? Oh no. Luffy then tells Zoro about why he decided to get involved. And of course the same reason resonates with Zoro as well because he saw the hunger that Otama experienced and how happy she was to taste uh, the Oshiruko. Now, one thing to keep in mind here about Zoro is that in chapter 955, we saw that Enma absorbs a lot of Ryo from Zoro, but then Zoro forces it to give it back to him. And he's actually told that if he were a weaker swordsman, that Enma would drain his hockey away and he would collapse. And so Zoro takes that as a challenge and he says, wait, so that means that once I get used to this sword, I'll be a lot stronger. And so if you look at the way that he's been using it, Thus far, we can infer that he's either already gotten stronger or that he's constantly resisting Enma's absorption. So it's a brief reminder that he's carrying a weapon that causes this push and pull effect to be going on. And thus far, he's been shown to have good control over it. Anyway, Luffy and Zoro get found out. And then a little bit later on, uh, Apu identifies Luffy immediately. But before that, there's this panel where the people, I'm assuming these are the people that got trapped under the rubble from the tower that Zoro cut. They're screaming out to Queen. They're like, Master Queen, please, a doctor. And Queen just flat out ignores them. <laughs> that was hands down the funniest part of the chapter for me. Like, people just straight up screaming, please, Master Queen, a doctor, help us. And then Queen is just like, who wants to be a member of the Toby Robo? No wonder why that one random pleasure guy didn't want to participate and he just wanted to keep drinking. They have no health insurance if they get hurt. At one point, Queen remembers that Babanuki slash Old Maid told him that everything was well in Udon, that everything was taken care of, which was obviously a lie. And there's actually a character that appears by the end of this chapter that looks a lot like Old Maid, but that guy has like a moose for a lower body and Old Maid has an elephant as a chest. So, And that's the thing about this chapter is that there's so many 
Smile Devilfruit users, it does get overwhelming. I, I know it's an opportunity for Oda to flex his creative muscles, but I do think it gets to be a bit too much for just one chapter. Uh, they're just panels upon panels of them. So what I would have done is I would have given the reader a break and shifted to another location. And not a long shift, just a short one to another place where we could have seen maybe uh, the rest of the Straw Hats, or Kanjudo and Momonosuke, or the Tobi Ropo, or Yamato. You get the picture. There's just so many interesting things going on all over Onigashima, so I think a small shift would have helped. That being said, there are some pretty funny and outrageous designs for some of the smileys. Uh, the ones that stand out to me the most are, <laughs> like, there's one girl that looks like she's essentially glued to the chest of a gorilla. I've seen her before this chapter. I'm just like making note of her. Then there's another female whose upper body is stuck to the neck of a giraffe. She kind of has like the Grim Reaper death seal vibe going on. Then there's another girl who has a chameleon for a lower body. And uh, another character that looks like he's wearing Gohan's great Sayaman outfit. But most importantly to me uh, is actually the appearance of yet another character that has the opened eye symbol on its face. The character kind of looks like a mummy to me <laughs> for some reason. So hopefully my speculation ends up being true and the characters that have that symbol on them turn out to be members of the Three-Eyed Tribe. Now Queen here actually says something very interesting. He says that he wants to get rid of one of the Toby Robo, and so that gets me to think that he either has a grudge already, a pre-established grudge with one of the Toby Robo, or that the Toby Robo already made their pick. I'm assuming that maybe one of them said, okay, if we find Yamato, then I want to fight Queen. Right now, I'm guessing that the member from the Toby Ropo who wants to challenge Queen, or, or the one who Queen has a grudge against, is Who's Who? Because in chapter 978, I remember Who's Who said something like, let's say, like, hypothetically, if, if Queen were to die tonight, who do you think would take his spot? So I'm assuming there's some kind of animosity there between Queen and Who's Who already. And then Luffy and Zoro charge forward against the Gifters. And Zoro says something that, again, just kind of gives me like Aeneas Lobby vibes where everybody's like heading towards the Tower of Justice so they can have their fights. Because uh, Zoro says Kaido's castle is probably in the back. And I'm guessing that he can smell all the alcohol coming from there. But then Apu appears and starts playing a musical tune on himself. And before I go any further, I just want to say that it's very cool how the speakers behind Apu spell out his name. Now, unfortunately for Luffy, Apu manages to connect an attack and actually land a hit. It seems like a, a, a supersonic sound traveling punch that he lands on him at first. And the first thought that I had when I saw that was about Naruto. That's usually where my mind goes. But but in this case, like, do you guys remember during the tuning exams where uh, Choji had to fight this guy from uh, the, the village, uh, the, the sound village? Well, Choji was fighting this guy from the SoundCloud village. And the guy said that the reason why his attack was able to be so effective was because the human body contains a lot of water. And so water is able to transmit the sound waves of his attacks. And so the first thing I thought of when I saw Apu hitting Luffy, even though he's made out of rubber, uh, was that, exactly this guy from SoundCloud. Now, the attack itself is actually very similar to the only previous attack that we've seen Apu use in the series, which is the one that he landed on Kizaru back in Sabodi Archipelago. The only big difference is that back in Sabodi, Apu actually starts off by playing his left arm like it's a clarinet. And in this chapter, it's actually his right arm. We see that he kind of detects catches his wrist uh, from his right arm and you see some chords there that he can play like a guitar. So the beginning of the attack is different, but everything else pretty much falls in line with what he did to Kizaru back in Sabodi Archipelago. I have to admit that I, at first I did think, wait, does this make sense that they got hit? More specifically for Luffy, because I thought, wait, couldn't he have used Future Sight to avoid getting hit like that? But then I thought, wait, what if Future Sight doesn't work with sound? Like, what if Future Sight allows you to see the future but not actually hear it. But then I was like, nope, that doesn't make any sense because Katakuri can literally recite what characters are about to say before they say it. So he must be hearing into the future as well. So I was like, okay, so that doesn't work. So what is it then? Why did they get hit that way? If you notice, uh, the first time that Luffy gets hit, he's not even paying attention to Apu. He's busy fighting Winnie the Pooh on steroids. And so that's the first hit that Apu lands on him. Luffy's like, what just happened? How did I get hit? He's kind of surprised, not calm at all. And then after that, Zoro gets slashed, which, by the way, it's again, it's the same process that happened to Kizaru, where Kizaru lost an arm because of the sound wave. What's cool, though, here is that even after Zoro gets slashed, 
uh, he's still blocking an attack from somebody who's coming at him. If you notice in that panel where we see him and Luffy, uh, he has his sword out and he's blocking a sword. He's like literally like, it's just like, you know, get out of my way. I have to focus on a poo. And by the way, I think it's important to remember that this attack caught Kizaru off guard. At first, he, he also didn't know what was going on. And so if Apu's attack was capable of catching an admiral off guard, I have no problem believing or accepting that it would also catch Luffy and Zoro off guard. Because it's just such a weird and unique devil fruit power. Although maybe Kizaru was actually just trolling, just messing with him. Ooh, enjoyable music. Now, if we go back to that panel that I was referencing with Zoro kind of blocking a guy on the side, uh, there's a moment where I think it's Zoro who says, here comes another wave, or, or here comes another one. And then Luffy responds and he says, I know. So to me, that makes it kind of clear that Luffy is using future sight in that moment, but yet he still gets hit. So did he see himself get hit and allowed it to happen? Did he, did he get hit on purpose? Also, who says, here comes another one? Was it Zoro? And if it was Zoro, how did he know that another blast was coming? Is it because he knew about Apu's powers? Uh, it, it's just really strange. But to me, like the fact that Luffy says, I know, to me is a very clear indication that he, he's seeing what's gonna happen. So is it possible that maybe he knew he was going to be okay from taking the blast and so he allowed himself? But then that doesn't make any sense. Like why take damage this early on in the game? Like Zoro even says it himself. He says, if we continue to take this much damage this early on, we won't last once we reach Kaido. So it's one of two options. Either they got caught off guard or Apu's Devil Fruit is just broken. Now here's the thing. If they got caught off guard, then there's no way that Luffy would have been able to use Future Sight. Because in order to use Future Sight, you, you gotta be calm and focused, right? Not distracted. So it, it just, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for him to say, I know, I know what's coming. Uh, if he's distracted. Because again, in order to use Future Sight, you have to be able to read the intent behind your opponent's attack. So I, I'm not sure how that works. If he got caught off guard, how was he using Future Sight? It's kind of contradictory uh, concepts there. Unless he just made an assumption based on Apu's check it out, and that's how he figured it out. Actually, you know what? I think the chapter gives us an answer. Uh, it's by the end where Luffy, both, both Luffy and Zoro are okay from the attacks, but Luffy says no more disguises, they're hard to move in. So I think that even, yeah, so he was using Future Sight, he just couldn't move fast enough to avoid the attack. I'm gonna go with that. That's my final word. Take it or leave it. Uh, let me know in the comment section what you think happened. Anyway, Apu starts beating his chest like he's King Kong, which rings the gong or beats the drums. And so that creates an explosion of the sound waves that are near Luffy and he gets sent flying. And I like how the way that Zoro runs away with him is similar to the way that Sanji ran away with him after Big Mom pushed him out of gear fourth. Because at the end of the day, that's what friends are for. Friends are those people that carry you away from danger, like some type of burnt deflating carcass. Now to be fair here, I think the reason for why a lot of us, myself included, slept on Apu was because aside from what he did to Kizaru, we haven't really seen a lot of feats from him. In, in fact, we've actually kind of seen and heard that he kind of runs away from stuff. Uh, he ran away from those wild boars, pre-time skip, and then after that, we heard from Brule in Whole Cake Island that Apu went to Whole Cake and then he was like, oh no, I gotta get out of here. So he ran away from that as well. And then he betrayed Kid's alliance. So to be fair, I think knowing what we knew about him, I think it, it's kind of fair that we slept on him. But then again, we have Oda here telling us, don't sleep on people, especially the supernova and expect the unexpected. Now here's another thing about Apu, is that even after Luffy gets hit and he says like, yeah, these, these guys, is, they're, they're hard to move in. Apu says that he actually has another attack, a follow-up attack. He calls it the, the subwoofer, something like that, which is I think a, a loudspeaker, uh, kind of like an amplifier kind of a thing. But he had that, the, that attack in reserve. Uh, of course, he's not able to, to execute it because Kid shows up, but man, Apu is no joke. No wonder Kaido got him in his ranks. Uh, so this chapter definitely allowed me to appreciate his character a bit more. Uh, but anyway, Kid shows up because he's upset. 
very angry at him. The two of them, Kid and Apu, have been butting heads since Sabote. And I think it's time for a story. All right, so here's what happened. And it's a great story, by the way. I love telling this story. Apu and Kid were at a bar. It was a good day, good afternoon at Sabote Archipelago. Kid was enjoying himself. He had a mug of cold beer, hot wings on the side. The the dressing was ranch, all great stuff. He was thinking about uh, tipping the waitress well, too, because the waitress was doing a good job. And then he sees Apu staring at him from across the room. What is going on? Who is this guy? He's staring at me. That's not cool. I can't finish my hot wings like this. Boom. Right? And Apu says, yo, if you want to fight, we, we should wait till we get to the other side of the line. The red line. New World, a.k.a. foreshadowing, right? Eventually, the fight breaks apart because we see each of them in different locations afterwards with no damage. But what I'm assuming here is that Kid must know something about Apu's fighting style. More than most, at least, because of this incident here and because of them meeting up to discuss an alliance to try and take down Shanks. And so funnily enough, I found an article from 2015 that states that apparently there's some evidence to suggest that magnetism can have power over sound. I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, when we apply a magnetic field, they, they meaning the sound vibrations, the, the phonons, they tend to run into each other more frequently. Because the magnetic field increases the number of collisions, it also slows the phonons down and lowers the amount of heat they carry by 12%. Engineers can perhaps use this concept to control heat and sound waves magnetically. So if Oda really wants for Kid and Apu to duke it out, just based on devil fruit typing alone, I think it could make for a lot of fun. Speaking of a poo, are we ever gonna find out what that secret invisible sky path that he discovered was? That was such a cool thing that I would hate for it to not be brought back up again, or at least referenced. Kid, in a rage, rushes to a poo, gathering scraps of metal to build up his metal arm, and I like the small little detail that Oda included in a small panel where uh, he shows us that the reason for why Apu wasn't able to react to Kid in time was because there was too much smoke clouding his view. So he didn't see Kid coming until it was too late uh, because there was too much smoke from the explosion that Apu created. So Kid straight up squashes Apu with an attack called Punk Gibson, which is a reference to Mel Gibson, the director and the actor. Uh, no, it's actually a reference to a guitar brand. Uh, but anyway, I love the way that the attack looks, and man, I feel for Oda, or whoever it is that has to draw all of those metal components to Kid's hand, because I think about like when, once Kid starts getting more, more spotlight, man, how much time is it going to take for them to finish up these attacks with him, with all those little metal components? It looks beautiful, uh, so I really appreciate the work uh, from Oda, and possibly his assistance. It looks great. Now, despite the attack, I think Apu should be relatively okay after it. Uh, like, I don't think he's like knocked out or anything like that. I think that would be a disappointment. So I do think that he's gonna get back up. In Stampede, there's a scene where Kid can use black armament coating and he's not using black armament coating on this attack. So I, I do think that Apu is going to be able to get back up. That's going to do it for me. I thought the chapter was really good. Like I said in the beginning, I would have appreciated just, just one shift in the chapter to another place, but overall it was still a very good chapter. Let me know what you thought about it in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you did. Appreciate that. All that good stuff. Subscribe, please, if you want to, and I'll catch you guys later. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.